Why, hello, this is Sol, and today I'm going to do another one of those Q&A recaps starring in Hesychosis and Josh Allen, aka Lore. So, uh, well, by popular request, you're going to see me on screen again. whoop de doo No, actually, that's I don't feel so bad about it. But this is going to be, uh, as usual, it's going to be in a podcast format. You don't need to be watching me here, uh, but I will have the questions up on screen for you to take a look at. I'm going to be reciting them. And on, and on top of that, I'm going to give the abridged answers uh, that Ian gave to these questions, as well as my thoughts on them. So without further ado... Let's go. During the last update on Azrite armor, you mentioned adding another ring with spec-specific traits only. Will items be set up so that the same trait doesn't appear more than once between the two rings? Yes, is pretty much it. Uh, although there were a number of other updates too. One is that the outer ring will only have spec-specific traits, so don't get used to, or at least don't consider what we're seeing right now, where you'll see some of those generic-looking traits. All of them are going to be ones that directly affect your spec. Also, and this kind of goes without saying, but I at least want to get that thought out there, uh, traits can only stack up to three. Next question, would you consider changing the Azerite system to have traits save spec-based versus item-based? Having one set of 380 shoulders is so frustrating to balance between specs that I avoid other content due to reforging. The short answer was no, unfortunately, so we are going to be still be subject to uh, exponential, uh, exponentially increasing gold costs for those who like to switch their specs uh, fairly often. Ian did make a number of points, many of which uh, you folks at home and elsewhere may not entirely agree with, including the idea that, well, there are generic traits that you can choose if, you ha if you're having trouble, uh, if, if you're having challenges uh, switching between one spec and another, you can just go for that generic one that fits both roles. He also pointed out that the excessive gold costs are more of a niche or more, you know, just more of an edge case scenario rather than the thing that people will normally do, spending possibly tens of thousands of gold switching their specs. I admit that the question itself is a bit hyperbolic. I mean, he says that it's so frustrating to balance between specs that I avoid, straight up avoid other content because of reforging because of gold cost you're so you're going to stop doing things because you don't want to change specs or it's it's just so awful for you to go for one of those generic traits i'm sure that for some of you folks at home the answer is yeah absolutely but i don't believe that i don't believe this to be the case of like everybody or even anything close to a majority the last point that Ian made had to do with what was essentially a hybrid tax or having a necessary friction when it comes to switching between uh, switching between traits uh, time and time again because under the uh, under the guise of being able to freely swap out your Azerite traits, it would be as if the game had to be balanced around your character or your class or your specialization to be assumed that you can access everything all the time whenever you want. And with the game having that much freedom, which I acknowledge that some people would, would absolutely love to have, but having too much freedom in that case, it sort of disturbs the identity of you as a character when you want to say, hey, yeah, I'm really good at this AOE spec. In a world of that sort of freedom, it's not just you have this awesome AOE spec, you're just a mage who can adapt for whatever situation. That's not entirely a bad thing, but in this case, this is simply a Blizzard design decision. So it's more like uh, something that you just don't like, but is not necessarily bad. Next question, how does restricting Azerite trait reforging through exponential gold costs improve gameplay? With the new Outer Ring in 8.1, this seems like it will severely punish players who play multiple specs. You know, I didn't intend to, but I guess I covered both questions anyway. <laughs> Whoops. Next question. Will there be new traits on Mythic Plus Azerite gear in 8.1 and beyond? Or are those of us focusing on dungeons as our only endgame activity stuck with the same ones for two years? Basically, yes. Now, for one thing, uh, in 8.1, we're going to start that whole Battle for Azeroth Season 2 dungeon thingamajigger, where we're going to get the new Azerite gear with the additional ring. So that's that, that in itself is going to really change up the meta. On top of that, though, there is the expected revamp of some of these traits, as well as the retiring of some others that don't happen to be very 
popular. There weren't any that were specified in this case, but I'm just going to guess that, you know, some of the really uh, boring ones, like I think Earthlink comes to mind, where it's just like this cycling thing of strength, I believe. <laughs> like, I'm hoping that both uh, between the primary and the lesser traits that are in those, I guess what's going to be the third and fourth rings, I'm hoping that some of those are revamped a little bit or made just slightly more exciting. Next question. Any plans on changing the way to acquire Azerite gear from Mythic Plus dungeons? The fact that you can only get it from the weekly chest at the moment is slightly disappointing and frustrating. So this question wasn't exactly answered, it was more like a, yeah we want to do it, we just haven't quite figured it out yet. But they did acknowledge that, quote, it sucks. All right, he said it, you know, he, he, he made it in mission. Ooh, you all can feel better now. Unfortunately though, he doesn't have an answer and a lot of it is because they still want to stay consistent with the rate at which you obtain gear relative to how you get gear from heroics or, you know, normal mythics or raids where you only get them once a day, once a week, or and so on and so forth. The very clear problem with the Mythic Plus a weekly chest is that it's one chest, and from that you get a lot of different pieces of Azerite gear. Or not, if you happen to not get Azerite gear and you get yet another ring. <laughs> they shared one idea that I happen to suggest as well, just having the chance to get Azerite gear at the end of a Mythic Dungeon run. Or Mythic Plus dungeon run, sorry. Have the Azerite gear scale appropriately, but with a maximum item level so that the uh, weekly chest still has the strongest version of that particular item, but you can get at least one step down, just like how you just like how you get normal gear now. But Ian is hesitant to have that sort of system that promotes just the spamming of Mythic Plus dungeons, even though you can target a uh, certain kind of gear that you want. I kind of agree with this, kind of don't. I can potentially see some weird behavior in part of players who are looking to uh, complete certain uh, looking to complete dungeons at like uh, as high of a level as possible in order to get that certain piece of targeted gear. But at the same time, it doesn't seem that bad either. So my suggestion to Blizzard, fuck it. Just do it anyway. Give it a shot. The worst thing that would happen would be getting complaints from players feeling that they need to consistently run, you know, XYZ dungeon on this certain level in order to get the kind of gear that they want. But at the very, very least, Blizzard can, and even I would identify those players as those who just don't have the self-control to... Uh, you know, just farm their weekly chest instead. I don't mean to debase those kinds of players. They, I mean, they just want to get good gear. But I would also say that while they may be a loud segment of players, that it, it's a pretty small number. That's just my guess, though. Next question. What's the deal with traits that require third-party sites like Wowhead to explain what they actually do? Resetting traits can quickly reach insane gold costs, so testing on your own is not a good option. Ian answered the question by identifying one of the primary PvP traits that drop like a certain banner that give some random stat based on apparently your race, which is something I did not know about. For those of you who aren't familiar with that trait, uh, the tooltip essentially says it essentially says nothing, and I believe the expectation is set that that's going to be resolved by the next patch. Next question. Will you be retiring any of the older traits in 8.1? Right now it just feels like there are so many of them, and the newer 8.1 traits will end up being so few compared to the older ones. I answered this one in a previous question, which is yes, they will in fact retire some of the old and otherwise unpopular traits. Next question. Are tanks being looked at? It's extremely underwhelming that guilds are mostly looking for brewmasters and death knights because they're way too strong compared to the others. Ian talked on for a good while about tank ballots, but ultimately it sums up to, yes, they are being looked at. He identified protection warriors, notably their rotation, as well as guardian druids as areas of opportunity, meanwhile leaving the poor protection paladin alone with the retribution aura. Oh my god, retribution aura. It's going to be a little bit difficult to measure just what is happening with tanks as soon as a pass is done, mostly because the measure of a tank's survivability is reliant on the content that is trying to beat our face in. So when it comes to raid encounters, uh, certain affixes, we don't know what the new um, Mythic Plus uh, seasonal affix is going to be. So all of that remains to be seen. It's just that paladins and demon hunters are just going to be left alone. Oh well. Next question. 
Resto Shaman are decent stacked healers and abysmal spread healers, while other healers excel at both. We're also the most unappealing Mythic Plus healer. What spec and talent changes can we expect based on the immense feedback you've been given? Specific to Restoration Shaman, while this isn't set in stone, the kind of expectation that we can see in the, ne in the next patch is that single target healing might be upped, but the broader answer covered just healing balance overall that will hopefully be addressed in 8.1. Ian pointed out Disc Priest, not just in raids, but in PvP and Mythic Plus, uh, as a very versatile healer that can still do decent healing while doing a little bit of uh, pretty good damage at the same time. So from the sounds of that, we can probably expect Discipline Priest nerfs. Sorry guys. But overall, what they're trying to look for is to make it so that classes or specs that are good at a certain kind of healing or a certain kind of anything will be the best at that. Otherwise, healers or specs that are more versatile in their role don't do better than the specialized uh, than the specialized class. Next question. The current PvP meta of everybody having tons of self-heal plus insane burst damage and healing controlling the flow of battle has left rot classes in the dust. Unholy DKs and a Affliction locks feel useless. Any plans to address? As someone who's not 100% on, as someone who is not 100% on top of PvP, and yet I've been doing a lot more PvP in this expansion than I have in previous expansions, it feels like this has been an ongoing conversation since the beginning of time and before that, and it's going to happen after that, after WoW shuts down, and people are still going to be asking about PvP balance in arenas. Ian's answer to this question basically acknowledged the uh, prevalence of burst when it comes to burst healing as well as burst DPS and, and controlling that flow in order, to, in order to win. However, he also mentioned that changing things too much on the fly every week through, uh, via hotfixes would be a little bit too heavy-handed and would disturb the meta on a competitive level. Because when it comes to PvP, the meta is something that requires like a bit of time in order for things to settle down. And from there, Blizzard can take a look at what's working, what's not, what classes are ridiculously far behind, and in this case, it may be uh, dot classes or rot classes like DKs and Affliction Locks. And from there, make adjustments to like PvP talents, which is what they mentioned. Next question. Will the new Warfront run its cycle in parallel with the current one? So instead of waiting three to four weeks for a new cycle, you start a new one every one to two weeks? Yes. And Ian also identified that on day one of the Tides of Vengeance 8-1 patch, that the Alliance will be able to immediately queue up and run the Darkshore Warfront. ta -da! Next question. Any comment on why we still can't queue as raid groups for the Warfronts? This answer was kind of interesting because it went into the design of, of this particular Warfront because it was built in mind to be run by uh, pugs or you know smaller pre-made groups but not an entire raid. So the way the Urathi Warfront is run is centered entirely around getting those demolishers or those catapults or whatever up so they can bring down those gates and then you can eventually win it. So in a pre-made group, you can smash all of the objectives and take over all the territories, but then you would spend the next X number of minutes, however long that is, to get your demolishers up and running, to get them all the way down to the gate, and to have them pew pew at the gate for a while. So according to their testing, that wait time that we experience uh, on live right now when we're you know when we finish everything and we're just kind of waiting for that gate to go down it would just be that much worse if we happen to be in an organized pre-made group that said ian also hinted at the possibility of having a new kind of warfront like a heroic warfront or mythic warfront whatever that is in fact designed around a tightly knit organized group Unfortunately, there's no uh, PvP-based one, but I mean, that's a battleground anyway, but, but, but that's beside the point. The possibility for more difficult and possibly more rewarding Warfronts is out there, which I think is pretty cool. I'm just wondering, what the heck would that reward be? Next question. Do you have any plans to readjust the Death Knight starting area slash questline for the introduction of new allied races? I'm purposefully reading into this a little bit too much, but they said no, that they don't have any current plans, but it's something that they want to address in the near future. So what does that mean? I totally get that there is like a timeline or a narrative to fit. I mean, why don't we have um, gnomish demon hunters? We already know the answer to that one. 
I do get that some races can fit right now. Um, Dark Iron Dwarves come to mind, uh, possibly Cool Turin Humans, uh, and, and maybe some others. But if they are going to address this in the near future, something tells me that instead they're just going to make a brand new experience, like bring it to 2018, 2019, whenever that thing is going to come out. From there, we'll see Death Knights under the Bolvar Lich King paradigm, and we'll see how that works out. Next question. Are there any plans to relax the unlock requirements around the Legion allied races? They're not quite going to relax the requirements, but instead they're going to buff the reputation that you get from completing quests and what have you that are related to these allied races. So they're going to cut it in half. I don't entirely know what that translates to, but cutting it in half is, well, it's still cutting it in half. Next question. How do you think the Siege of Zuldazar raid layout will affect the world first race since Horde and Alliance will have bosses in different orders? There are two answers that Ian gave to this one. One is that considering the boss layouts, they can if they felt like it and they didn't say for sure if this was going to happen. But he also talked about how the world first race really doesn't have much to do with, in the end, how Blizzard conducts its uh, raid design. He said that the world first race is something that is born and bred by the players, and I agree with that. We've seen it with uh, with all the stuff that Method has been doing in the previous world first Mythic race, and it was extremely successful. Meanwhile, Blizzard had pretty much no hand in it, at least as far as as far as I know. In other words, Blizzard is relying on the community to simply adapt to it in case they don't go through with this switching of order of, of how the bosses are killed. In fact, if I circle back real quick, uh, Blizzard did acknowledge that, well, their acknowledgement of, I guess, the world race would be with the Hall of Fame leaderboard for both the Horde version and the Alliance version of the raid. I do think it's cool that there's going to be a Horde world first and an Alliance world first, but when it comes to world first, world first, it's going to come down to the encounter design. Which boss is going to be the effective wall at one point? So if the Horde version has a wall that comes later than the Alliance version, well, that's kind of disadvantageous. My suggestion, though, is to, yeah, just go ahead. Uh, don't take any risks in this case and just have relative parity between these bosses. Next question. Raid trinkets in Uldir have been terrible in comparison to other trinkets outside of the raid with no changes. Can we expect better tuning in 8.1, or do we need to keep hoping for higher Titanforge trinkets from Mythic Plus or World Quests? In my opinion, this was a tougher question for Ian to answer because unlike previous, oh, I'm sorry, unlike expansions previous to Legion, there are just a lot more trinkets that are out there. He talked about trinkets that have a certain kind of flavor. You know, when you hit a target like five times, it does some some static amount of damage, and it's like really cool. As opposed to more uh, stat-based trinkets, where it's an on use and you get a certain number of stats for X number of seconds. Those kinds of trinkets are demonstrably more effective, at least in the right hands. Effective use on a non-use trinket along with your cooldown pots and lining it up during a burn phase with bloodlust, it's going to get you a lot more effect than that random proc. So the intention that Ian's talking about is to get a relative parity between these two uh, styles of trinket. Next question. Raiding has lost its uniqueness with the removal of tier sets, endgame weapons, and trinkets also coming from Mythic Plus and etc. Any plans to bring uniqueness back to raids? For me at least, gear has pretty much nothing to do with why a raid feels unique from other pieces of content, uh, but in the context of this question, what Ian said, he wanted to make a return of smaller tier sets, so like two-piece tier sets. I'm not quite sure if we're going to see that uh, in, in an upcoming raid, in this upcoming raid, which was, what is it called? The Battle for Dazara Lore? Yeah, that's way too many syllables. Anyway, it's more like smaller two-piece bonuses that, uh, that Ian and Blizzard might be looking forward to in the future. These two-piece bonuses are going to be something that is going to be across the board in dungeons and in raids, and the uniqueness from them are simply the kinds of procs that you get from them. The interesting thing, if they do go about that paradigm, is is there going to be a uniqueness there, as in are the raid ones going to, going to always be better than the ones from uh, Dungeons or Mythic Plus? Because there's certainly going to be more variety from Mythic Plus, and, but not so much in a raid, which, you know, there's only one that comes out at the time. Next question. Any concrete plans to make island objectives more varied? Current structure is just AoE and mine your way to the finish. They do plan on adding more things, but to be honest, I don't think it's ever going to be enough. I mean, you could have 
you know, 50 or 100 different kinds of combinations of things that you can have. But after you're but doing these day after day, if you decide to do these day after day, it's still going to start feeling repetitive after a while. But Ian did at least talk about a sort of capture point or an Azerite extractor, where once you hold on to it, or once you capture it, it'll slowly pump your score up by a little bit, unless the other faction happens to take it back. That part's nice, but I would like to see something a little bit more hectic, like let's say the other faction or you guys can all of a sudden go to the other uh, faction's ship and you know, literally take Azerite from them. I am interested and pretty optimistic to see what they have next. However, the reality of the situation is that this is uh, you know, continually repetitive content, so it's gonna get old no matter what. Next question. He said that RP servers would not be affected by cross-realm sharding, yet I've seen many, many servers sharded into the Emerald Dream. What's going on? In this case, Ian was kind of guessing what might have been going on, which could be a number of factors. In war mode, for example, the system or the machine is going to make sure that faction balance is in parity, regardless of any other rule sets as well as uh, roleplay. Beyond that though, as Ian identified, it may just be ambient activity. People might just be grouping up uh, using the group finder and like some of the auto queue and stuff in order to complete quests or take down world bosses, um, elite rares, and that sort of thing. Next question. You hinted at change to the group finder for Mythic Plus, such as being able to search by key level. Are those still in the works? Yes. Dun -da -da -da. Next question. Currently, finishing war campaign to get fifth follower takes a while. Any plans to make it more alt friendly? Yes and no to this particular question. Let me let me explain what's going on. According to Ian, yes, you still do need to complete the war campaign in order to get that fifth follower. However, while you're doing that war campaign, you're going to get a lot more rep than you did before, making it hopefully so that the war campaign itself is pretty trivial to finish, which makes it not bad. Now I can use my alt army and I don't know, use the mission tables to get tons and tons of fish. Oh boy. Or herbs. Yeah, probably herbs. So that about wraps up the Q&A and my thoughts on it were... It was a Q&A. Ooh. So what did you think, folks, at home and on the toilet? Were your grievances addressed? Are you shocked that Ian isn't going to delay the patch so they can totally revamp Azerite, knowing that it would take a couple months? Okay, that last one was a bit snarky, but... I'm going to leave it in there. If you enjoyed these recaps, please hit that like button so I can keep doing them. And subscribe to the channel too, so I can keep giving you more of this and all things Warcraft. I'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and stay breezy.